Hi, the Latte Panda Alpha SBC is a bit of a beast, not only in horsepower, but also in price. In this video, I take a look at benchmarks on Windows, Linux, and OS X, and also give my perspective on why Latte Panda made a huge mistake. So why do I think the Latte Panda is a big mistake? Well, let's first have a look at what it is and then run a few benchmarks. The Latte Panda Alpha is a pretty expensive SBC. The Alpha 800 sells for 300 US dollars, while the Alpha 864 will set you back around 360 US dollars. For people living down under and with the current exchange rate, the Alpha 864 will set you back 500 kangaroo bucks. That's a pretty hefty price tag. Fortunately for me, I bought this one in US dollars. So what do you get for your hard earned money? Starting from the top right, working clockwise. HDMI capable of 4K at 60 frames per second. Gigabit ethernet. Audio jack. USB type C, both for power and EDP. 12 volt DC header supporting a wide 10 to 15 volts. So you could theoretically power this directly from your vehicle's battery. 50 pin GPIO header, and you get two of them. Power button header. User controlled LED via an Arduino. Power LED. Three USB 3.0 ports. Arduino reset button. RTC battery. PWM fan header. And power button. On the flip side, we have some connector I haven't figured out yet. M2 key E and also M2 key M slots, touch panel interface, EDP ribbon connector, and SD slot. The board I have varies slightly from all online documentation. So I'm guessing that it's a more recent version. So you may see this on the bottom side. Moving on to the chipsets, Latte Panda haven't released any schematics for these SPCs, but we can poke around a bit on the PCB. Starting from the top right, we have a bunch of P-channel MOSFETs, an unknown semi, but possibly something to do with power control. Variable output LDO capable of sourcing up to two amps. A bunch of EST protection ICs, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth module, USB 2.0 hub controller, running off a 12 megahertz clock, a piddly 8 mega 32U4 with a 16 megahertz crystal, Yet another P-channel MOSFET, another unknown IC, but probably another MOSFET, and another unknown IC, but the fact that there's an inductor nearby is probably a DC buck converter. Some more EST protection, wind bond 256 megabit SPI flash, another unknown IC, but possibly a six channel DMUXer IC from TI. Another unknown semi, but probably another MOSFET. SIPEX RS232 transceiver supporting 3 TX and 5 RX channels. USB UART bridge. I'm gathering that the Arduino is connected to the main board via the RS232 transceiver, USB UART bridge, and then USB 2.0 hub. Flipping over to the front again, we have a USB Type-C power IC, which manages power distribution from the USB Type-C connector supporting up to 5 amps at 20 volts. Realtek ALC269 audio codec chip, dual port gigabit ethernet coils, another unknown IC, NPN power transistor, Realtek gigabit ethernet transceiver supporting PCIe. Yet another P-channel MOSFET, and another, and another. But here's a 3.3 volt 8 milliamp DC buck converter designed for CPUs. A couple more unknown ICs. Seems to be a few of them, but I'm guessing that there's some type of DC buck converter. And a semi that is a blast from the past. Something that you would see on almost all desktops. This is the IC that provides UARTs, SMBUS and ACPI control, BIOS and other goodies running an old 8032 MCU. There's also the 64 gig flash, 8 gig RAM, and the mighty Intel CPU. 
For my tests I used two 512GB M2 SSDs. One running Linux and another Mac OS X. Of course I used the default Windows install that runs off the eMMC. Chucking the small antennas on is always a bit of a bugger. The Latte Panda Alpha is also a pretty power hungry SPC requiring a 12 volt 4 amp USB type C power pack. But since I wanted to log the power consumption during all my tests, I used a power logger attached to the DC input header, which was attached to my bench power supply. Then Ethernet, HDMI, keyboard and mouse. Like the original Latte Panda, the Alpha doesn't boot automatically, so you have to hold down the power button for a couple of seconds. But after that, you will see a Windows desktop appear after about 12 seconds. Nice! You have full control over power off and sleep from Windows, and interestingly, the SPC will shut down to only 40 milliamps current draw, which is the lowest of all the SPCs I've seen. So right out of the box, can you actually use the Arduino from Windows without any fiddling? Yep, runs the LED blinky example without issue. And also the fade example. What about ITC? Using an MCP9808 temperature sensor? Okay, a little bit off, but you can read values from ITC without issue. So out of the box, everything works as advertised. Nice to see. Moving on to graphics performance, what does the onboard Intel HD615 graphics give us? Running the TimeSpy 3D Mark benchmark shows a pretty abysmal two frames per second. But you can't really expect it to perform like an Uber gaming rig. However, the iStorm benchmark was pretty smooth often reaching 200 frames per second with an average of 100 frames per second. Moving on to the GFX bench showed it once again to be pretty smooth. The final FPS scores were, well, okay, decent enough, I guess, with the lowest being 12 frames per second and the highest 64 frames per second. Not surprisingly, this places it alongside an Apple MacBook Pro, which runs the same CPU as the Alpha. During the tests, I logged both power and temperature. With an ambient room temperature of 33 degrees Celsius, the max temperature I saw was 86 degrees, with an average of 68 and a minimum of 58. The board does get a little toasty, however, and externally, I was measuring a max of 52.7 on top with a max of 57.1 degrees Celsius near this CPU underneath. On the power side, it drew a max of 2.4 amps, an average of 818 milliamps, and a minimum of 40 milliamps. Bear in mind that this is at 12 volts, which is similar to the Nano PCT4, so not a low power SPC at all. So enough of Windows testing, let's move on to Linux. I'll be using the latest stock Debian install media for my Linux tests. I burnt this to a USB flash drive using Etcher and chucked that into one of the USB ports. Getting into the BIOS is as simple as pressing the delete key as many times as you can Yay! after you press the power button. Like any decent BIOS, there's a fair amount of options. But we want to boot from the USB flash drive and then progress on with the usual Debian install. And really, there was nothing odd or unusual with the install. It behaved like any other desktop or notebook install with well-supported hardware. Once installed and rebooted, you'll get a desktop in around 12 seconds. Nice. And the speed of upgrading and installing extra packages on the OS shows that we're not dealing with an ordinary SBC here. Linux could see the onboard Arduino without issue, so I'm not going to rehash those tests. So first on to some graphics tests. I used the superposition benchmark from Unijun, which was really a little slow, spitting out at the end a measly 4 frames per second maximum. Note that this was with the stock Debian install with no additional graphics driver hacks used. I'll have to publish a later video with updates to these tests. 
GLX gears came up with 490 frames per second, which was good to see. And the Geek's 3D tests were fairly interesting. Playing my YouTube intro video at 1080p had no lag or stutter. But playing a 4K video on a 1080p display showed up a fair amount of stuttering, which is to be expected with non-optimized graphics drivers. Network speeds were, of course, lightning fast. Apart from graphics, there's not a heck of a lot you can pin on this SPC. On the GPIO side, you, of course, can't see any SPI or ITC, as this is provided by the Arduino. But you can see the Arduino USB to UART bridge, and additional serial interface provided by the Arduino. You also have access to CPU temperature and frequency control. Over these initial tests, I saw a maximum current draw of 2.4 amps, with an average of 705 milliamps and a minimum of 21 milliamps. On the temperature side, I saw a maximum of 80 degrees, with an average of 65 and a minimum of 58. So on to Phronics tests. I ran my usual battery of benchmarks over a couple of days, and what were the results? Throughout pretty much all the benchmarks, the Latte Panda Alpha came out on top, beating everything else by a substantial margin. Almost three times faster than the Nano PCT4 for RAM speed, 940 megabits per second Ethernet throughput, lightning fast on Go, Perl, Python, and PHP, outstripping even the Jetson boards beating the Odroid XU4 on 3D rendering. Almost every benchmark, it was beating the current reigning Jetson SBCs by a fair amount. The only test where it lost to the Jetson was the Tiny Mem benchmark. During all these benchmarks, I saw a pretty similar current draw, with a maximum of 2.4 amps, average of 939 milliamps, and a minimum of 443 milliamps. And temperature was fairly stable as well, coming in at a slightly lower max temperature of 81.5, average of 69, and a minimum of 58. One thing I did notice is that the 12 volt rail was pretty stable throughout all my tests, with only a 250 millivolt variance, and is one of the reasons for the decent stability of this SBC. So next on to Mac OS X tests. One of the main reasons why I wanted this SBC is, well, to publish a review on it, but also to use it as a backup Premiere Pro editing desktop. And I plan to edit my next video using the Latte Panda, just to see how it goes. So I need to install OS X. I was going to publish a brief video on how to install OS X on the Latte Panda Alpha, but really just head on over to Don's channel, Nova Spirit Tech, to find his excellent step-by-step -step guide. Once everything was installed, it came up with a fully functioning Mac OS X. With the only issues being drivers for Wi-Fi, audio, CPU temperature and frequency scaling. So time for some subjective tests before I get onto Phronix. Yep, YouTube videos played without issue. The Arduino Leonardo serial port was visible, so let's check that out. Yep, all okay there. I'd be surprised if it didn't work. So I then ran a bunch of Pharonix tests on OS X to see how it differed from Linux. SQL Lite had a pretty huge difference, but this was due to the fact that I used a slightly slower SSD for Linux than Mac OS X. Linux was overall slightly faster in benchmarks from then on, which is due to the fact that OS X runs a lot of extra processes in the background consuming CPU time. Overall, it was pretty well matched with Linux, which was to be expected. The same could be said for power consumption. During install, it pulled 2.4 amps with an average of 921 milliamps. While running Phronix tests, it hit a peak of 2.3 amps with an average of 544 milliamps. So for such a great performing SBC, why do I still think it's a big mistake? It's actually not the price because even though it's expensive, bang for your buck is pretty good. It's not the design of the board. You can power it from a wide 10 to 15 volts, making it suitable for in-vehicle use, and shuts down to a 40 milliamp quiz and current. Surprisingly, it comes down to the embedded side. 
Sure, the Arduino is easily accessible on all iOS platforms. You have access to all the GPIOs and it can run even with the main CPU powered down. But they used a piddly small Atmega 3 tu 4 What they should have done is use a much faster, more modern MCU. Any one of the 80 SAM series like the SAM D21 or SAM D51 or even the STM32 series would have been a much better option. The way it stands, it looks like the Arduino side of things was just an afterthought that was designed in at the last minute. Another thing they should have done is not have the Arduino as part of the base PCB, but as an add-on. I'm almost pretty certain that most people who buy this board won't ever use the Arduino. Anyway, that about wraps this review up. Like the Nano PCT4 review, I'll need to publish a part two follow-up video where I go into 4K multi-head tests and also other benchmarks. So hit subscribe if you want to be notified when I publish that video. And I really can't do without my Patreon supporters who really keep this channel going. If you want to become a supporter, then head on over to Patreon and it'd be great to have you on board. Thanks for watching and see you next time.